Next up comes a topic far from dear to my heart, implementation inheritance. OK. So for better or worse, Java will allow you to write classes where you can give code to your, your subclasses. You guys, if you took 61A, have seen this. All right. Um, so it allows you to inherit not just the signatures. Instead of just saying what the rules are, you can actually give code to your babies. Okay? So you can specify, in other words, not just what a list 61B should do, but also how it ought to do it. And to do that, we can use a keyword that, by the way, your TAs probably don't know well because this is a new Java 8 feature, but I think it's a little more cleanly done here than the usual way, um, where we can use the so-called default keyword to specify a method that everybody should inherit. Okay? So let's say we want list 61Bs to be able to print, but we are just geniuses, and we're going to do it ourselves, and we're not going to let SList and ALIST do it, or we're going to tell them how to do it. So to do that, I'm going to write default public void print, uh, and then what I'm going to do is explain how you can print out a list. Now, of course, we can only use these methods. We can't use anything that's part of an S list or an A list because we don't know about it, right? As far as we're concerned, these are the methods we get to work with. So to do that, well, how could we print out a list just using these methods? Yeah, we could use get, all right? So we could do, for example, for int i equals 0, i less than what? Size, OK, so if I know my size, all right? And then I just go through and then do what? Now I'll print out the get i plus space, let's say. Um, and sure, we get a space at the end, but we're lazy. Uh, and so what this will do, it should print out anything. Uh, any list should now be able to print, whether it's an S list, an A list, or a list that has not been invented. Let's try compiling. And we get, of course, main method not found, but it compiled. Okay. So now let's try using our word utils. So we're going to insert elk are watching, and we're going to tell our S list here to print. Okay, I run it, elk are watching. I do a list. That also works just fine. Okay. So this method here works for all the classes. So all the classes below it all inherit this method. Okay. So there you go. That's our print method. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Ah, so can we override? Yes, actually we can. And in fact, we will shortly. All right. So here's another question for you guys okay, to think about. Efficiency question of the day out of nowhere. Uh, do you like the way we've implemented it? We're the, we're the, we're the list designers. Okay. Do you think it'll be efficient for both of our classes? And just use your intuition about what I mean by efficient and inefficient. And maybe think about how Git works. Or size. Maybe I'll put up the Git method. Well, no. You need this to be able to see. We'll call it a day very shortly. Quiet in here today. I wonder why that might be. <laughs> All right. Uh, so if we look at S lists get method versus A lists get method, let's see. Where's git? It's so small I can't even find it. Ah, there it is. Here's git for A list. Here's git for S list. Okay. This one has to actually iterate over the list. So as those of you who answered, uh, it is indeed true that a list git should be pretty fast, and s list just seems slow. And again, after the midterm, actually in like four weeks, we'll talk a lot more about efficiency. But just to build our gut feelings. It is the case that it's fisher for a list, not for s list. And effectively, it's just that every time you call git, you're basically starting back over. So imagine again our naked gods, all you know, growing never less beautiful or tired, because even though they're two weeks old. They're immortal, right? So you ask the first one, or you ask, give me the zero with naked god, the first, the second, the third. And by the time you're asking for the 500th one, you're like, you know, running over here, saying, great. OK. All right, 501. All right. All right, all right, all right. All right. you got the idea. So if I did that over and over, what's that thing called you do? That kind of run for sports? Suicide. Suicides. <laughs> Is that what they're called? Yeah. All right. I thought they had a cooler, more simple name. Anyway. All right. Got it. 
Now, if you don't like a default method because you don't trust the boss, the person that created the List61B class, so you can override it, just like you can override an AOL method to answer the question earlier. So what we could do is make our own estList uh, method here. All right. So what we're going to do now is uh, at override here, and we're going to do public this is S list, right? Yeah, public void print. And we're going to say we don't like the boss's print statement. Uh, in this case, I'm going to say for node p equals uh, sentinel.next, p not equal to null, p equals p.next. Yes, you can do for statement or for loops with these. Ooh. Uh, and then I can print out p plus. And again, the exact details of what I'm doing right now aren't that important. Uh, it's just that I'm noting that we can make our own print statement that will be more efficient, that we can iterate over our list more beautifully than any old boss list could, right? The boss just doesn't get it. We know how to print. Let us do things our way. So let's try compiling and see if it worked. Okay. okay. Now we try running it. And Elk are watching, and now it's more efficient. Not that you could tell. Okay. All right. Any thoughts about that? Okay. And again, in this case, Remember that override is not necessary. It's just there so that if I accidentally did print or something, then it'll yell at me and say, oh, you didn't actually override this. Because it would be really, really annoying. Suppose you're like submitting code for, to an auto grader, hypothetically, and you had overridden a method and you hadn't put override, and then your, your default method was being slow. You know, you could spend like hours trying to debug this thing. That hopefully wouldn't happen because you would catch yourself earlier by putting in that or something and realizing it's not doing that. Uh, but, yes, override helps prevent those kind of issues. Okay? That's all it's there for, for the most part. Okay. So, now a little puzzle for you. No clicker this time. Uh, let's recall, then, that uh, dog variables can hold poodles, or list variables can hold s list. We can, and in fact, I like to write code that looks like this. Say, let's instantiate an s list, but store it in a list61b container. It's sort of a, a, a type purism, right? I believe that this is the platonic ideal, the most beautiful kind of list. So I'm gonna, just going to do this for, this feels right to me personally. So when I call some list.insert front with all these, and then I say some list.print, in this case, which one do you think will run? The, the slow boss version or the uh, fast native version? Keeping in mind that we're using some list to do printing. Who thinks it'll be the boss's print? Okay, not many. How about the subordinates print? Okay, indeed it shall. And so why does this work? Okay, a lot of terminology today. Ready for another one? All right. So every variable in Java, right, has a compile time type, sometimes called static type, if you read older 61B notes or Paul Helfinger's uh, reference book. Uh, and that's the type that you get when you declare a variable, right? But variables, of course, also have a, another type, which is what they actually are. You're going to give it as like its true type or something, or its runtime type, or sometimes you'll even hear dynamic type. And that's the type you say when you instantiate. So if we ask about the variable sum list, its static type is list 61B. That's the type that is permanent and unchanging, but it also has a runtime type that could change if I do, for example, sum list equals new A list. So when you want to resolve which function runs when you have overriding, so if we have a method where we have an object which has one compile type and another run type, type um, then whenever what we'll use is the subclasses method if it overrides the superclasses. Okay? So there's this term known as dynamic method selection. At runtime, Java decides, you know what, I'm actually going to run the subordinates method. Okay? So it happens only when you have a subclass that has overridden a superclass's method. That is it. Okay? That's overriding. And that's dynamic method selection. That's the one thing that I find when you do the worksheet uh, or the gorilla sections. This is the thing that right now it seems very natural, but we'll throw somewhat more complicated situations at you and you'll think, Ugh. all right, maybe. Okay? So now I have another puzzle for you. Suppose we instead define two overloaded methods as follows. Okay? So what this method does is it takes a list 61B and it prints the back item. And here I have one that prints the front item. Okay? And the only difference is their signatures and their behavior. They're the same name. Okay? So it's overloaded, not overridden. My question then is, what do you think will happen? Okay? This one I'm going to leave also open to. Uh, oh, jeez. Didn't mean to press that. Well, anyway, nothing happened. Maybe that was the wrong answer. Okay. So I want you to think about it. Even though you've now seen, oh, why did I do that? Anyway, all right. So what I want to know is if I insert elk are watching into 
an S list, right? Uh, that is, so an S list that's stored in an S list container and one that's stored in a list 61B container, and then I call these two, which one will print which, okay? Uh, will they be the same, perhaps? <laughs> Because wouldn't dynamic method selection imply they should be the same? <laughs> okay. You know the answer. All right. So. Oh, well, see, the thing is, you might be tempted to think, well, isn't an S list really a list 61B? Therefore, they both are going to show the front and they'll both be elk, but no. This one will be watching. Okay. So I tried to set you up for failure, then gave you the successful answer, and then you got to see it again. Eh. Well, it's not like this is recorded on the internet forever or anything. Uh, okay, so this seems like the exact opposite of what we just saw with dynamic method selection, and the reason it's different is because of the fact that here this is not a case where we have a subclass overriding a superclass, and we're trying to decide which of the two methods, right? There's, it's like asking, should the dog bark or should the poodle bark? That's not the question we're asking. It's totally different. There's no, there's no overridden method here at all. This is an overloaded method, okay? So I just want to draw that distinction because at some point it's going to confuse you, all right? So you've heard it once in lecture, and that's why I'll give you practice so you can remember which one's which. Okay. Yes? Interesting. So if we construct a more complicated example, example where these are, um, hmm. you want to have both overloading and overriding at once. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Got it. Okay. So that's an interesting question. I think it would probably take a little bit of time to construct a good example, but I'll make sure there's one on the Gorilla Section worksheet that I think is exactly what you just said. Okay. So I'll, I'll defer that one for later because I don't think I can construct an example on the fly quick enough that's crisp. Okay. Um, so to compare these two, right? Dynamic method selection, it's only going to happen when you're overwriting. When you have an instance method, um, of a subtype that's overriding something in the supertype. Good noise. What a jargony sentence there. But, hey. uh, but it does not happen for overloaded. Okay? So if you have um, one class that has two methods, one for the subtype and one for the supertype, like this situation, I have two methods, one for dogs and one for poodles, there's no dynamic method selection there. Okay? Um, 